and a very warm welcome at Hyde Park tonight. We would like to talk about the concerns of the youth because there has been common perception that uh, it was the youth of this country that made the change back in 2015, when I say change, uh, the change in government, shift in policy. Um, of course, to do this, we thought we'd invite uh, somebody from a party that has um, come forward to make clear uh, officially declare its presidential candidate and I think it's opportune time that at Hyde Park we start talking politics and what matters to the youth of this country. May I warmly welcome the chairman of the Sri Lanka People's Youth Front, the youth wing of the Sri Lanka Podujana Peramuna parliamentarian, Dilum Amunukama. Good evening. Good evening, a warm welcome. Um, there has been general concern among the youth, as I said, about how their, uh, their, their future will be shaped in this given political scenario. And also, um, you as a young politician who's in the forefront of all this, um, not as a politician, let's start off as a, as, as a young person of this country. Where do we go um, ahead from here? What do we look forward to in this present political scenario? Uh, actually, the present uh, scenario is uh, uh, very different from uh, what we saw in the past because uh, uh, the youth right now in the country are thoroughly disappointed with the administration and generally uh, with politics as a whole because uh, they feel... Uh, are you too? Uh, in politics? not in politics but uh, I would stand by the youth because uh, in a way yes uh, the youth had been uh, betrayed uh, with the previous uh, with, with this administration the, the current administration because as you said uh, you were correct to say that this administration was uh, mostly voted in by the youth because uh, they uh, had uh, their mandate was to have good governance and uh, corruption free governance uh, which uh, which is what they exactly went against uh, they promised good governance they promised uh, anti-corruption but uh, as a whole they started off with corruption and uh, no good governance at all and clashes between the two parties uh, resulting in uh, huge strikes university students uh, leading to uh, strikes, graduates which are jobs all over the country, which uh, was not what they were promised. Uh, they were promised uh, luxury. They were promised uh, Wi-Fi. They were promised cheap vehicles. They were promised all sort of things. So uh, in a way, you could say that the youth was fooled by the present administration. They didn't know they didn't know that at the time that they were voting, but now they have got to know. So that has brought uh, the youth to a disappointment uh, with the government, obviously, and also uh, with politics, uh, which what they see on your channels and on news and what's going on in the country. Uh, that is where we are right now. So we have to work uh, on a way uh, to get the youth out of it and obviously to get this political situation out of it. So what do we look at beyond this? Because obviously uh, young people have been worried for decades about what the future would be like for them in this country. Um, brain drain, a lot of young people moving out of the country, uh, seeking uh, better opportunities outside. But in the creation of uh, opportunities, given the, the kind of resources we have in this country, what are we to look forward to? Yeah, first of all, uh, I must say that uh, even the youth did not act responsibly uh, at the last elections because the the mandate which was given was uh, by the look of it impossible. The promises that were included in the 100 day uh, operation which they promised and which never happened uh, and even the the other uh, whatever the, the the documents which followed the, 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 there were so many so many documents that followed but uh, the government could not carry out any of these and uh, also uh, their main campaign 
Mr. Maitri Pala Sirisen and then even Ranil Vikram Singh. Their main campaign uh, was uh, against the previous government was uh, their slogan was corruption, uh, then human rights, uh, equal rights, uh, security, uh, then the ethnic issue. Uh, all these were their slogans, but they went against their own slogans. So uh, this is what has uh, led to this uh, disappointment and uh, we are hoping to do up a new plan, uh, the SLPP is a new party and uh, we are actually just two and a half years old and we have managed to uh, conquer almost about 3,000 local government institutions in our first uh, task that we uh, went into uh, polls. Mm -hmm. uh, so hopefully our next uh, poll situation will be a, a So are you election. expecting a youth driven uh, mandate this time or is that is that how you look at it? When you say in the last election the youth did not fulfill their um, responsibility to the nation, does that also mean that uh, this time you expect the youth to make yes. the driving force or do you think uh, we, we there will be uh, a problem in no, the expect, deciding power? No, we expect the youth to uh, act more responsibly, more responsibly and we uh, hope to guide them, not to vote for us, not just to go flat out and vote for us or to vote for our candidate, but uh, on certain aspects that they should go into before voting for someone. Because uh, what we see is you just uh, look at a TV advertisement, read a piece of paper and then you just walk in and you vote for someone who you think will do what they said which has never happened in this country. So uh, what we are trying to do through our youth organization also is to guide them uh, on uh, how you should select who is going to rule your country. Because uh, as you know if you, if, you, uh, if you go shopping and you want to buy something you go into the quality of it and all that. Even if you are buying a vehicle, you go into how many miles it has done, all that. Basically history, you go into the history. Uh, even if you are buying a pup or a pet, you go into the history. But uh, when we vote someone in to rule the country, we don't uh, go into their history and see and see what they have done. Yeah, you can listen to stuff which someone says, but uh, it can be true and it can be false. But you should be able to go in to their history and observe what has been going on and make a decision on that without making a decision purely on a mandate because mandate you can say anything which has been happening in this country you can say anything and not do it, it there have been so many occasions that this had happened and I must tell you that the Mahinda Chintana was the only mandate which was given to the public and carried out to up to about 90 percent maybe 10 percent was not carried out but the Mahinda Chintana mandate which was uh, given out by President Mahinda Rajapaksa was carried out to the extent of I could say even 95 percent. So that is uh, where we managed to come so far. Uh, when you said mileage, uh, the SLPP, as you rightly said, it's a very new party, but of course patronized by senior politicians. But what exactly is the youth doing here? What are you trying to do uh, when youth are so discouraged? Uh, a youth wing you set up, is it something we see as repetition of certain uh, youth political uh, gatherings that got together but did not go anywhere? No, I must tell you uh, that uh, the SLPP itself was not formed by leaders. You take uh, all the old political parties, even the UNP, the SLFP, uh, then the new party which uh, Honorable Gamini Sanayaka formed. Uh, all these parties were formed by leaders and the cadres were invited. That is how these parties are triggered off, uh, including the SLFP. So that is how they took some time to succeed. But the SLPP was formed in a different way where when President uh, Rajapaksa uh, withdrew and basically retired, it was the public who went to him and uh, as you can remember uh, Nuge Goda, which Vimal Vasu, the Gamampila uh, and uh, all these guys organized and then you go to Kandy, which was called Mahinda Sulanga. It was not a political movement, it was just uh, just an event organized by another few leaders. But this led to the ma huge May Day in Gold Face and that led into the formation of SLPP. So this was 
uh, actually formed by the people. That is why it is called Sri Lanka Padujana Peramuna because it was formed by the people. That's why it's called uh, called by that name. So uh, we want the youth wing also to be formed and guided on the ideas and the ideology of the youth and not the politicians. So that is how we have formed this SLPP youth because we have gone to almost, uh, there are 160 electorates in the country. We have already covered about 120. We go there, we gather them uh, somewhere and we have given them uh, a, 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 some sort of document and we have got their idea on that document and uh, right now we have covered about 120 electorates in the country. So we expect to cover the rest before the 24th of August and uh, prepare a declaration mm -hmm. which will be called uh, the Lotus Declaration. Uh, it will be and the, our theme will be uh, Youth for Growth. The theme which we will right. be carrying out our operation. So you be believe in power to the youth, uh, correct? Regardless no, of not only not only power, we believe in them being involved in the administration. Mm -hmm in many ways. But is that possible it is in possible. the present uh, is political scenario where um, th where youth really do not have the kind of opportunity to go beyond uh, what they what they are allowed? Yeah, that is what we are trying to change because uh, as it is what they are allowed to do politically is to read somebody's mandate and just to watch a TV advert and decide whom to vote for and then listen to someone slinging mud against the uh, other party and then they have to make a decision. So this is what we want to change through the SLPP youth. As I told you previously, we want to guide them on how to select your governing party or your leader to govern the country and how to decide. And then obviously uh, we expect the new uh, presidential candidate to take our youth declaration very seriously mm -hmm. because it had been uh, taken around the whole country. 160 electorates will be covered by the uh, 24th. Uh, uh, the youth ideas of all those electorates will be included in that. It won't be a final document. Right. It will be a bunch of ideas. But we expect the, uh, the new candidate to take this very seriously and include it in his manifesto that he will publish uh, before he runs for presidency. Um, talking about pledges, uh, back in 2015, the change of government came uh, came with the, a pledge to instill good governance, transparency, um, and to institutionalize the system in such a way that uh, uh, policies and implementation flows without uh, any authorities intervention and when you look at indexers to um, reports to all these other international rankings uh, there has been a mention that Sri Lanka has made a significant stride towards uh, good governance but doesn't that mean in that case that this government has been successful to its pledge in keeping its pledge if in uh, I don't know where these success stories have been written exactly but if someone says that uh, good governance has uh, succeeded in Sri Lanka, there is a huge default in uh, the way they had gone into it because as you can see from the start to right now, the country has been crashing and obviously that's because the government, uh, the governance has not been good. You start with the central bank. It was cleared of its funds by its own gov governor appointed by the prime minister. Uh, you take the Easter attack, you saw all these uh, guys coming and giving evidence in front of the select committee. Uh, you can't help laughing sometimes, you, you're not supposed to laugh, but sometimes you can't help laughing uh, on uh, how seriously they have taken their job. Uh, there is a wrong uh, sort of ideology where some people think that reducing your powers is good governance. That is wrong. Because uh, a if you have a certain power on a certain area, that power is used to govern, a, govern that area. Govern that maybe a ministry, mm -hmm. maybe the presidency, maybe the prime ministership. Mm -hmm. Those powers have been allocated so that you can run the show. So when you let go of all those powers and you have no power whatsoever, 
then you can't order someone and get anything done and then you can't govern. That is exactly what has happened to the present president. Be with the 19th amendment, he, uh, he seemed to have thought that good governance is getting rid of some of his powers and he got rid of his vital powers and uh, he has put the national security, uh, including the economy, in a very bad situation. So there is a big difference between these amendments and good governance. If the govern if we had good governance, then this government has to be a good government government actually. So it doesn't seem to be that. So you still believe in a stronger executive, the president, uh, even even in the hypothetical scenario again, uh, where the president is from your party and the government is from your party. Still, you would want to do away with the Nineteenth Amendment. Is that so? Yeah, personally, I think we should do away th with this Nineteenth uh, Amendment. It's not about the presidency only. Mm -hmm. It's about uh, it's about anything. Now you take the chief of the police. The, 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 the problem a couple of months back where yeah, the president wanted the chief of the police changed. But he couldn't do that. The, the chief had gone to courts. Now that case is in courts. And there is a huge ha-ho about the whole thing. So the thing is, uh, OK, take your, your channel. Take, take Dharana. If your CEO doesn't have the powers to govern Dharana or control your channel, this channel is going to run haywire. Uh, so it is the same thing being president or governor, being president is being CEO of the country. So, uh, and uh, uh, being CEO of the Rana is also, it's not the same thing, but it, it works in the same way. So, uh, whatever CEO has to have, or CEO, manager, maybe department head, needs sufficient powers to uh, govern that department, country, province, whatever. So, uh, if you think that taking away all this powers and just putting it somewhere to some commission. Now there was this, uh, the main one of the main slogans were independent commissions. So we have an independent police commission uh, who could not get a correct IGB and blew up a couple of churches on last Easter. Then you have an independent election commission where we have not seen elections for the last five or six years and elections uh, delayed beyond date. So uh, it is the same thing. So you could just say it's good because generally when you let go of something you have, it just looks good. But it doesn't work that way. So 19th Amendment, I think we should do away with it. We're at Hyde Park talking to parliamentarian Dilum Amunugama about youth development and national security in Sri Lanka. Uh, but since we uh, went into a break with the elections that you were talking about, highlighting the delay in elections, I thought we'll start off there here. Uh, the delay in provincial council elections has been a constant topic that has been uh, uh, the, the, the kind of opposition and all the, all, that, all the concerns that you raise as a party, Sri Lanka Pudujana Peramuna and other opposition camps. Uh, but you become the first party, as I said, uh, as we all know, to declare your presidential candidate, although that was also a question at a certain point. But now there is opinion sought whether uh, we should go in for provincial council elections first or presidential uh, elections first because provincial council elections has been delayed. But uh, your party doesn't seem happy with that. Why the change of heart? No, that's, that's wrong. We are happy with any election. There is no issue about that. The only thing we were not happy about is about delaying elections. Uh, the provincial council or the 13th, uh, according to the 13th amendment, uh, provincial council elections cannot be delayed under any circumstances. Other elections can, but under the 13th amendment, you cannot delay a provincial council election. The reason is because the 13th Amendment was brought in as a solution for the ethnic issue. I don't know whether it was a solution, but it was brought in as a solution for the uh, ethnic issue. So uh, exactly because of that, you're not, you don't have a legal loophole to delay provincial council elections. But the government managed to create a loophole. They created a loophole, they brought a new uh, amendment in, increasing uh, the, num the percentage of uh, female candidates. 
supposed to get involved in uh, provincial councils. And the only amendment they bought is that. But they did not bring the delimitations. They did not bring the other clauses. So they just brought this single thing, passed it in the parliament with the JVP. Uh, and the sole cause was to delay provincial ele elections because they would have gone for a huge defeat if they went for elections. So now, presidential election is new. So now, they are trying to use this provincial council election. Okay, obviously they have to have something. But they are trying to use this option to delay the presidential election. So, uh, our regard is not about which election we are having. It is about delaying each and every election. Mm -hmm. As it is, they have delayed the provincial council. Some councils up to three years. Their yeah. term is four years. And they have almost delayed it one whole term. But would you want these provincial council uh, councils to be at the hands of unelected authorities continuously? No, even after presidential, I mean, when, when presidential elections, uh, they say, could be held after this? No, it's, that is not the issue. These institutions have been under unelected members for almost three years, which is totally wrong. It is, it's illegal, basically. Uh, the funds which they are utilizing, their operations, if someone challenges it's, it, in, it in courts, it's illegal. But uh, our concern is we are ready to go for any election, but they are only, uh, they, they, their target or what they are trying to do is just to use this to delay another one and then use something else to delay that one. So we are ready with any election. Our only concern is about not having elections and not letting people vote. If you, if there is good governance and if they say there is democracy, one of the basic rights is to let the people vote at the right time, which this government is uh, not doing. So uh, we are not against the provincial council elections. If that is it, we are ready. But uh, since they were talking about the presidential election, and since, since the president's term is due, we have forwarded our candidate uh, and we are ready. So pro provincial councils, we have been ready for a long time. Uh, the development drive after the war spearheaded by the former regime, of course, uh, was marred by accusations of corruption. Uh, this, this is an accusation brought forth by the government that preceded yours uh, back in 2015. But uh, if we see an SLPP-led government or a president, uh, wouldn't we be seeing uh, most of the very same faces that were seen in the previous regime uh, who, who have also been accused of uh, such corruption? The, the ac accusations anyone can make, but all these had been taken to courts. There was a new financial unit established under the Prime Minister called the FCID, which took all, almost each and every member of us uh, to this institution in question. Uh, uh, even your chiefs were taken and questioned regarding uh, certain areas. So uh, they were trying hard to frame their opponents by using these special units. But they miserably failed because uh, obviously when they went to courts, we should say that there was justice done and the courts didn't uh, agree with them. If you take Mr. Garmini Senrat's case, it was dismissed. So many cases like that. Uh, everyone, all, almost all the Rajapaksas were arrested. Almost all the former ministers were arrested. So those are just accusations. But uh, the people who are accusing the former regime started with the central bank and with wiping out uh, entire uh, wiping out the entire economy of the country so uh, yes there will be uh, most of the faces there might be some faces from the previous year team, but uh, that doesn't mean uh, that uh, there was fault in the previous regime or that uh, there is going to be fault in the future um, we have seen scuffles in Parliament too, but your candidate specifically uh, during his uh, address, made an address at the SLPP convention on the 11th, uh, made it clear that he wanted an honourable election campaign leading up to the presidential polls. But uh, if we see a Parliament that comes falls under a presidency of uh, your candidate, um, how are we expecting to um, overcome these challenges? Because Parliament has been the centre of uh, scuffles to uh, unethical behaviour. No, yeah, scuffles, yes, I, I, I wouldn't agree with that. If I was also involved in one of those things. But the thing is, uh, when you look at it on television, it doesn't look good. But you got to see what triggered it. Uh, running the Parliament, keeping the parliament uh, under control 
is the responsibility of the speaker being fair by everyone being fair by the rule and standing by the orders uh, is the speaker's responsibility so obviously members who have been elected i wouldn't approve each and every thing that happened but members who have been elected by the public from their districts cannot just go and sit there and watch the speaker or someone just overruling everything not obeying the standing orders and just bulldozing even the president the last couple that happened in parliament was the speaker right or wrong but the speaker has no right to overrule the president but he was even trying to overrule the the president so this is uh, where all this starts but what mr rajapaksa said in his speech uh, was uh, prior to the parliament he was talking about the campaign so he wanted a very peaceful campaign a very environment friendly campaign uh, and he wanted uh, also the uh, uh, hassle free campaign so that the public uh, would not get affected by uh, his uh, presidential campaign Uh, we have seen at certain stages of our history uh, communities um, at each other in hatred uh, whereas we've tried to instill peace reconciliation right after the war too uh, and even uh, in the unfortunate incident in digana where you were also in the midst of all controversies uh, but youth uprising against especially from community to com- community we saw that even after easter attacks where a national uh, issue of uh, an unfortunate string of attacks on humanity was quickly transformed into ethnic disharmony Uh, how are we looking at this going forward uh, this is also based on uh, national security because uh, when you say national security it can be uh, a clash between ethnic groups it can be a invasion of some sort from outside so all this is national security uh, it you you can have clashes in the same ethnic group within uh like what happened with the explosions uh, last uh, easter so the thing is when national security collapses uh, the government loses control of the security setup uh, someone would say that it happened at our time or oh, yes beerwala incident uh, was during our during uh, our rule but uh, it, there was uh, a issue there there was some sort of uh, active ethnic conflict but it was uh, sealed off in beerwal itself it was not allowed to spread through the country if you take the digana issue which uh, i was questioned and i also was uh, taken to the terrorism division and all that uh, the teldin the tel it was it was actually teldin mm-hmm. it started in teldin yeah, which was a, a a accident a normal motor accident which occurred which uh, some guys were having a drink and someone bumped into their three wheeler and they just fled the area and then these guys followed him and then they assault these guys and unfortunately this uh, youth passed away so this was the initial incident which was not ethnically based at all they didn't know who was driving the truck and the truck driver didn't know who was in the three wheeler but this was allowed to transform into a ethnic issue ethnic conflict by the uh, uh, chief who were in charge of the security and at that time obviously the police and uh, why we were taken in the eyes as mps of the area when i saw this happening i saw this brewing up in the village and uh, developing in the village i managed to inform them in advance i managed to inform them that something could go wrong within the next 24 hours so to make necessary to make necessary uh, security precautions so this is what they question me on they just wanted to know how i knew that this was going to happen uh, so their assumption is was i knew how i got to know about this is because i planned it that was their assumption so this is where we have failed if you take the east incident initially they couldn't stop the blast there was intelligence information but they still couldn't stop the blast uh, after the blast there were issues all over the country they couldn't try to stop those issues so i don't see how this can happen because uh, you assume this government was in control 
when Prabhakaran was around, he would have captured Colombo in 48 hours, according to this security situation in the country. That is what uh, Field Marshal Sarak Fonseca uh, keeps saying on and off, though he's a member of the government, about the uh, security situation in the country. So ethnic clashes, uh, invasions, uh, everything comes under national security. When national security fails, all this fails and you get all sort of clashes in the country. This is the, this is the whole problem. Uh, Field Marshal Saad Fonseca has been one of your biggest opponents too as a, as a uh, regime. He opposed your regime uh, by uh, also uh, joining hands, uh, yes. joining in the opposition camp back then. Uh, but um, the, the, since you're talking about the PSC um, uh, sittings, uh, the Parliamentary Select Committee that probes uh, the aftermath and uh, leading up to the Easter attacks, we've seen that uh, Prime Minister Ranil Wickremesinghe has come forward to testify and also um, there is uh, a certain inclination that the President might also um, come and um, make a case before the, the PSC. But, uh, are you saying that they are, if, if, if uh, they want to be that transparent in uh, talking about these, to be questioned, uh, that, that if there was, uh, if they were in the understanding of uh, any of these uh, uh, horrific attacks leading up to the Easter attacks would have been uh, probably uh, dealt with, that they would do this? Yeah, I would say they are uh, very transparent on what has happened. But uh, the thing is, what is the point? There are 350 people dead, uh, total economy destroyed, thousands of reservations, maybe yeah, thousands of reservations cancelled in the tourist industry. And you get this uh, select committee, people coming and giving evidence and uh, saying about how they didn't do their job properly. That's what they're saying. You take the police chief, you take the secretary of defense. You take the uh, minister of uh, the state minister of security, then um, everyone else other than the army commander, I would say, uh, who came there and gave evidence, it shows what sort of security we have had in the country. The only thing they say is we didn't know, we don't have experience, and they are just telling their story to the country, which is uh, you can you can't call that. Uh, transparent because national security is not letting the country blow up and then being transparent. You can't have 150 bombs going off in the country and then being very honest and transparent about that. That is not national security. So then we also could have let Prabhakaran take over Colombo and be, we could have been transparent about it. That is not the issue. National, national security is you have to safeguard the people. Uh, we saw the defense secretary saying that we cannot guard each and every church and each and every hotel. That is, that is not the vision. You have to guard, you have to guard each and every person because that is what national security is there for, uh, is to safeguard the whole country and each and every person, not the VIPs, not just the president and prime minister because all these people are voted in by the public. So priority one should be the public. During our regime, priority one was the public. Priority one was the sovereignty of the country and that is why we had to do with the LTT. So uh, the people have to decide, do you let the country blow up and then be transparent about it or do you stop the country being blown up? UNP Deputy Leader Sajid Premadasa is coming up, uh, there's a rally around him, uh, a campaign building within around him uh, as the next possible presidential candidate. But he too we saw in a recent rally uh, in Badul uh, where he said uh, he was coming forward to assert national security. He's promising what couldn't be done uh, by the leader of his party. Yes, he is trying to be the presidential candidate uh, of the UNP and we also wish him well and I hope he becomes the candidate because he's been waiting for it for a long time and it doesn't seem to be happening for a long time so we hope it at least happens this time and uh, the thing is he, he himself, I mean, Mr. Sarat Fonseca, all these guys are members of the present government but we see them uh, when you see certain comments that they make, someone would think that they, are, they have been in the opposition for the last four years. But the thing that they have forgotten is they are also a part and parcel of each and everything that happened. If it was the uh, central bank or the bond scam issue 
all these people are part and parcel of it as a government. You can't just be in government and get the perks and just withdraw when there is, when there is an issue. You can't do that. So you cannot come and say, I have been a minister for so long in this government, but uh, there was no national security. And when I become the president, I will have it. You, you can't say that. Because then uh, that itself shows that that's a very irresponsible statement. So uh, I don't know. Maybe he has a plan to do it. But if he had some sort of plan being a cabinet minister, they should have been able to uh, discuss about this. And even Field Marshal, he says that he was not taken seriously. But him not being taken seriously itself is a problem within the government. So I don't see any part of this government that can come out separately and uh, deal with national security or economy or, or the youth uh, in any way. We were talking about the presidential candidate, possible candidacy of uh, Sajid Premadasa from the UNP-led uh, forces. But let's talk about um, former defense secretary, now a presidential candidate of the SLPP, as you all declared on the 11th. But why Gotabe Rajapaksa at this point, when, when there has been continuous uh, allegations surrounding kidnappings and him um, being the introducer of the white man culture and also uh, shootings in cold blood? Well, this is all uh, fabric. This, this was all fabricated by our opposition to see that we lost the last election. This is the truth because uh, they, they talk about white vans. But can is there anyone that had gone and made a complaint about being um, abducted by a white van? Or you could talk about cold blood shootings, but you cannot uh, directly uh, target Mr. Rajapaksa, I must tell you that this, uh, if what they are trying to say is about the intelligence operations that were carried out at that time uh, and the intelligence officers that this government uh, in prison for more than three years and now they are out on bail and out of service and uh, which is the exact reason why the bombs went off on Easter was because they crippled the uh, military intelligence. If, if that is the question you are asking, that is a military operation. You could, it, no, it's, it's not whether it's a white van or a green jeep or a blue truck or whatever it is. But when there is a war going on, obviously there are intelligence operations. There are the first intelligence unit, there's a second intelligence unit in the country, which work. They work undercover. And obviously if they identify terrorists in some part of the country, they are arrested and they have to deal with the terrorists. That is a part of part and parts of war or national security in any country of the world. That's not only in Sri Lanka. So just because uh, Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa was the Secretary of Defense, uh, they try to say that uh, these abductions and all sort of things were done by him, which is totally wrong. He's not a person like that he, because he's a disciplined military officer. You take Ranil Vikram Singh. They have no right to talk about abductions because Ranil uh, Vikrama Singh is the godfather of the Goni Bill, the very famous Goni Bill in 89 and 90, which came to your house or to the playground and shook his head and took the youth to Batalanda where Mr. Vikrama Singh was residing, tortured them to death and um, set fire to them on old tires. You take Mr. Rana Singha Premadasa, uh, there is no difference. But uh, Gotabe, they were not military officers, but Gotabe Rajapaksa was a disciplined military officer, a major of the Sri Lanka army, and uh, he had gone through foreign training, all that. So a disciplined officer of that sort will fight a straight war. He will carry out intelligence operations, but he will not just go and abduct his opponent and bump him off, like what Mr. Premadas and Mr. Vikram Singh did. There would have been LTD carders who had been uh, bumped off by the intelligence. That is possible. But uh, there were no political opponents of but anybody that were abducted and bumped off. There's accusation about yeah, so uh, accusation. Uh, journalists to uh, ordinary yeah, citizens. Yeah, so accusation you can make. So you take Vikram Singh, there is accusation. You take uh, Radha Singh Premadasa, there is 
accusation. Mahindra Rajapaksa, the accusation you can have. So anyone can, anyone can accuse me. You can accuse me and say that I picked someone up and I was accused of uh, triggering the Digana project, the, the, the Digana riots. So, uh, but the Muslim uh, people of that area and uh, the public in Kandy, and even uh, Mr. Rauf Hakim was, was nice to say in Parliament that I worked with him to, to settle the situation. Uh, accusation came from the government. But within the government, Mr. Hakim said that I helped him to settle the situation. So that is accusation. So you can accuse anyone of anything. Uh, but the thing is, uh, Mr. Vikram Singh, you take former Mr. Premadasa, they are not just accused. They were proven, not in court. You take the Bataland Commission, we know how he got out of it. You take the videos, you know how he got out of it. You take Surya Khand, these have been seen and proven and they are, they, everyone knows what happened. But uh, accusations you can make, uh, there will be accusations in the future. So uh, you cannot uh, decide on whom to vote in as the president on accusations because obviously what in Sri Lankan politics the only thing that the opponents do is accuse the other person. You take, uh, if you saw Gotabe Rajapaksa's speech at the party convention, uh, I didn't see him accusing anyone of anything and I didn't see him talking about anyone else. But you take Mr. Sajid Premada's speech in uh, Badulla, it's a different thing because he was not named the candidate, that may be just a normal uh, rally that he had. But you take that uh, uh, rally or that uh, that event, it was just accusing and accusing and accusing someone of something. So uh, accusing you, uh, but it worked. Last election campaign, this accusation worked. That's why I told you that the youth should be more responsible, not just listen to accusation and mud, but you should go into detail, go into history. Just think, uh, think out of the uh, bowl and uh, decide on what to do. When you say accusations worked last year and you want you to be uh, responsible this time around, um, does that mean if, if they don't, that, that accusations will play a larger role in deciding uh, the election uh, uh, results? Yeah, it, should not, it was not only accusation. Accusation was one thing. Uh, slinging mud was the other thing. And then uh, just uh, throwing promises around like very... Uh, promises without no depth and uh, no possibility like about Wi-Fi and uh, bracelets and now according to him uh, gymnasium Since and cars all this uh, so it's, it's just uh, there's no depth so the you should you can listen to everything but you should go into the depth of that promise and see whether it it is possible uh, since you brought about uh, brought up about Wi-Fi what are you promising the youth uh, no, we are not just, prom we don't want to promise the youth, we don't want to put the worm on the bait. Because all this is just the, the worm on the, you're, you're just using bait to uh, get some votes. We, we have uh, done away with that concept. Uh, this Lotus Declaration that we will be uh, declaring on uh, the 24th of August at our youth, conven youth convention will uh, show the youth our proceeding and our formation. What we are planning to do. It won't say, it won't g be given in detail. It won't say Wi-Fi will be given free. It won't say cars may, will be made cheap. It won't be bait, but it will be a plan. It will be a program. It is called Youth for Growth. It will show how the youth can get involved in the growth and how that growth will benefit the youth. Within that Wi-Fi and all this detail will be there. But this is the main project we are talking about. So we have uh, done away with uh, putting bait on the fishing rod. But we want to give them a certain thing which they could uh, go into in detail, study it, and uh, go into Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa's history also and see whether he is a person who could uh, make it happen. And if they think he's the man who can do it, then they can vote for him.
Um, he did speak about economic stability along with uh, ensuring national security if he's elected to power. Uh, economic stability, he's a military man as you uh, also rightly explained about his uh, skills in that area. Uh, but the UNP government and the UNPers are known for their um, or are, are uh, accepted as the big brains in uh, economic missions. But how can uh, your that candidate is, uh, that work That is the about? biggest mistake that the, con that the uh, people in this country made is by thinking this. Because in no way are they uh, economists or they have no idea on how to bring the economy up. The only thing they did is they brought the economy right down to the bottom where the growth rate was uh, six point something, I don't know, six point something in 2015. They managed to bring the GDP to three, three point one something, which we are just above Afghanistan, if I'm not right. Afghanistan is the lowest. We are just beyond that. So this is how the UNP can uh, develop the economy. It's very clear. It's in black and white. It's on paper. Uh, national security is the key issue, the key of economic development. Uh, in our previous uh, government, when we took over, we had to take over with the war in the north and the east. And uh, then we were not in a good positioning economic-wise. But uh, soon after the war, ended, uh, we managed to lift it up. The GDP was at about, uh, I think, uh, four point something at that time. But by 2015, it came up to almost seven. It was six point, I can't remember the exact figure, six point something, but it came up almost to seven. Why it has gone down is, one issue is national security, and then there are uh, many more issues. So national security is a key factor in economic development. And the other uh, thing about Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa is he doesn't work alone. He has a team, uh, uh, very uh, qualified team who work for him uh, on uh, all sort of subjects, maybe economics, maybe uh, national security, maybe development, maybe infrastructure, maybe investment. He has a professional team or team of professionals, you could say a team of professionals who work with him and who are working on a plan with him. Uh, that is how he managed to uh, make uh, Colombo City uh, the best destination in, uh, uh, in uh, last year. He managed to bring Colombo as the best city or the best destina tourist destination in, in Asia. Uh, that is how he managed to bring these uh, undeveloped, a undeveloped areas in the capital were developed by uh, Mr. Rajapaksa uh, and these projects were uh, set aside as projects impossible. But uh, the impossible was uh, made possible at that time by Defence Secretary uh, Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa. So I think uh, he might be able to uh, make many more projects which seem impossible uh, by everyone. Uh, as possible projects being the president of the country. Uh, when you say um, this government's uh, economic uh, vision hasn't been successful, um, the, 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 the hindrance they highlight as is the fact that uh, your regime pushed them into in the country into a debt trap. And uh, this year we're managing a 4.5 essential bank predicts a growth uh, GDP growth rate. But that too, uh, the government says is possible because of a large amount of debt that was serviced this year. But uh, the ongoing obligations to service debt that was borrowed through your regime, um, is their concern? That is totally wrong. Uh, the thing is, it's not the amount of, of debt you have. It is the loan to GDP ratio. That is what is most important because it's the amount of loans you have and the GDP you have. Because if your GDP is high, you can obviously pay your loans. So the thing is, uh, when we took over, the GDP to loan ratio was minus. It was somewhere minus uh, four or five. We are paying loans was impossible. And then there was an ongoing war. It's not the sum that is important. 
But uh, as I uh, told you before, we managed to bring the GDP up. We are the paying capacity. Obviously, if, if your salary is increased, then obviously you could go for another loan and you, you have the capacity to pay back. But if your salary is cut, then you can't pay your loans and then you're down and your economy is down and then your household economy will go down. It, it is the same theory. So uh, all these loans were taken for development. Uh, this government has, t uh, has taken, uh, has actually lent triple the amount that we lent but with nothing on the table. Uh, there were uh, places that we lent but there was a port on the table, there was a highway, there, there was something on the, on the table or, or on the ground, actually. But uh, this government has lent three times than what we lent. The taxation has doubled. It was uh, increased by 100%. So someone was paying 1,000 bucks tax a month is paying 2,000 bucks. Mm -hmm. So the tax collection has doubled. Even the finance minister, uh, he agreed on that when someone questioned him on parliament that the taxation has doubled. Uh, the lending has tripled. And then if the taxation has doubled, then your paying capacity is more. But they have failed to pay. And then the GDP is going down. This cannot happen if it's uh, managed properly. So this is total mismanagement. Are you saying 70 to 80 percent of uh, debt to GDP is manageable at this point? Sorry? 70 to 80 percent of debt to GDP, uh, a ratio of that Not amount. at this time. Not at this time. Well, the GDP has gone down to three. So obviously if you bring the GDP up, your paying capacity is more. Uh, when you bring your GDP down, then obviously it is not possible. So that is why this whole thing is going. And that is why they are going into more debt. Uh, the, uh, as an example, uh, their solution to pay Hambantota uh, port debt, which was being paid by the port itself. The Hambantota port loan was being paid by the port's authority. The government was not paying this loan. Yeah, port's authority belongs to the government. That is a different thing. But the port's authority revenue was paying the Hamban to the loan. And it was not a burden on the government. But they went and sold off the port, but still they, are, they not managed to pay the loan. So it clearly shows that it is mismanaged. I wouldn't say they are doing it on purpose, but they have totally mismanaged the situation and brought the country into a huge economic and financial crisis. And now they managed to get a security crisis included as well. Thank you very much for your time here. That's all we have at Hyde Park. All the very best. Thank you. Thanks a lot. We had with us uh, Dilum Amunugama, parliamentarian and chairman of the Sri Lanka People's Youth Front, the youth wing of the Sri Lanka Puduchana Peramuna. We'll meet you again next week at the same time at Hyde Park.